Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. My name is Elavaris, and welcome back to Root. As some of you may know, this year I competed in the 2023 Root Winter Tournament, hosted by Garrick Samples from Garrick Samples Games on both Twitch and YouTube, as well as Lily from MakeCraftGame.com. They have hosted winter tournaments such as this one annually for a few years now, and it is the biggest Root tournament that exists within the community. This year, since I have only played Root for about six months, I was able to join in for the first time to test my skills against some of the best Root players out there. The tournament is double elimination and has an approximate player count of 110 people. Now, my favorite faction in Root by quite a long shot is the Riverfolk Company. The open-endedness of their turns, the variety in play styles, and the immense amount of table talk you have to partake in to be successful makes them a very complex yet rewarding faction. However, the Riverfolk have performed very poorly in the tournament thus far. In fact, before the game you're about to witness, the Riverfolk was the only faction that had not won a single game despite 36 games having been played. Why is this? Well, the Riverfolk Company has been suffering ever since the onset of the so-called Marauder meta, which is the meta that emerged with the release of the Marauders expansion. The expansion that introduced rats, badgers, and I believe advanced setup. There are a few factors at play here. First, advanced setup is a new form of setup added to Root that allows players to A, pick their faction from a draft of five factions, and B, pick three cards from a starting pool of five to start the game with. There's a few other minutiae I won't get in, into now, um, but that's all you really need to know. Now, given that information, not only are players now able to pick a faction that suits their hand, but they also get a larger selection of cards as opposed to what they were given in standard setup, where they get a faction and then are handed three cards at random. So this means that there is a much lower need for the cards that the otters sell, as you likely already have a lot of what you need if you picked that faction and drafted your hand properly. Second, both factions introduced in the Marauders expansion were militant, heavy battling factions. The Riverfolk's largest weakness is how expensive it is for them to get warriors on the board. Two battles can be enough to wipe an otter ball off the map, and two battles is pretty easy for both the Lord of the Hundreds and the Keepers in Iron, which were the two factions introduced with Marauders. Even if you don't know much about them or never seen them played, they are heavy battling factions. So there is simply a larger pool of factions that can easily police the Otters now. And third, a significant number of people are still in the pre-Marauder mindset of when the River Folk were extremely strong and thus refused to purchase more than a couple times. In the 2020 Root Winter Tournament, they had the highest win rate of any faction at 46%. But in the 2021 tournament, they actually um, dropped to a win rate of 16%. And despite this sharp decline, there are still a lot of people in or who have the perception of River Folk dominance. And people will frequently say things like, two buys are going to hand River Folk the game which unfortunately works very much against them due to how poorly they are doing in the Marauder meta. So all in all, River Folk are in a tough spot. This tournament, they have been, le they have been left unpicked numerous times and have yet to win a game. Until today. So let me walk you through how I managed to turn things around for my favorite faction and pull off the first victory for the River Folk Company in the round two winners bracket of the 2023 Root Winter Tournament. A note before we begin, Garrick, the tournament host, has graciously allowed me to use his high quality source footage for this review. If you would like to watch the game in full, which I do recommend so you get the entire feel of the game, uh, the commentator's words, and all the table talk, you can find a link to the VOD on his YouTube channel in the description. So what is the purpose of this video? Well, I believe that higher level river folk play, especially in a meta that is really awful for them, 
just hasn't been showcased much in terms of guides, in terms of discussion, in terms of gameplay. And a lot of the content that's out there is from years ago when they were in a very dominant position. Nowadays, with how much more effort it really takes to win as the River Folk, with how little tolerance the faction has for mistakes, it's honestly quite difficult to play them at a high level. There's a lot of decisions you need to make that you got to be really involved at the table talk. You're analyzing, honestly, basically every possible facet of the game deeply in order to actually pull off this faction. So my hope is that through this video, I can give you guys insight into my decision making in a way that can provide value to those of you who are not used to more advanced river folk play. So now, without further ado, let's get into the draft and kick off my commentary of this game. All right, so the draft is the Underground Duchy, the Harrier, the Scoundrel, the Erie Dynasties, and the Riverfolk Company. The way the ad set draft works is that everyone is randomly assigned a pick order and you take your turn in the reverse of your pick order. So if you pick first, you take your turn fourth. I end up picking second, meaning I take my turn third. Erie ends up being the first pick and they go for the despot leader because they cannot guarantee that they will get the first battle required to pick the charismatic leader, uh, often referred to as the god of war strategy, where you pick charismatic and you intend to never turmoil and build your decree in such a way. Uh, they are unable to pick that because they can't guarantee that they can get their first battle if people set up far away from them. So this is a very racy matchup with the exception of the otters and the scoundrel the duchy harrier and eerie especially when the eerie goes for despot which can very easily transition into a double build um and just chew up a lot of easy cardboard for example if the otters get picked then there could be a lot of trade posts around that just give tons of points uh, the despot races the underground duchy wants to sit in a corner and build up their ministers pop down a bunch of buildings towards the end and just race and the harrier having access to their glide ability gives them the freedom of movement to be a very potent infamy farming faction uh, so we've got a very racy matchup the otters not as good at racing uh, they tend to be more of a bursty faction kind of depends on how much they're fed but even in the marauder meta they tend to not race very well because of how hard they can get policed so this is a very cursed matchup i would say this is probably not going to be a very entangled game so i go second or i pick second and i make the incredibly risky play of choosing the river folk now why do i do this given i am likely to be left behind in a race the answer really comes down to the fact that i'm a lot more comfortable with them and since they haven't won and I'm kind of known as the otters player in a lot of the circles I play in and that I'm quite good at them, I honestly really wanted to try and give the otters their first win. When I actually talk in the game, uh, you hear me say like, you know, do I be the people's champion and pick the river folk company or do I be the people's enemy and pick the duchy? And I end up deciding to go with the river folk company, see if I can pull out a big win for the otters, give them their first win of the tournament. Would I recommend picking them in this matchup? No, uh, I would not. If you are familiar with moles, uh, I would definitely suggest going moles if you're left with this sort of choice. They're just so, so good. At the point I'm recording this, they have the highest win rate in the tournament. I believe they're tied with the Erie Dynasties. Um, they're just so incredibly good. They're very resilient. It takes a lot of coordinated table policing to keep you down, and they often just have very good chances in the end game, regardless of whether they're policed or not. Uh, it's very hard to knock them out of the game. The otters are very easy to be inefficient with, and that is one of the largest problems that I see when people play them. So no, I wouldn't recommend it, but I did it because I wanted to try. Um, so what does this pick mean for our game? Well, given the game is going to be a race and I don't really want to race because I can't really race that well, I'm going to need to police a lot to slow people down. 
and will likely need to do so early if given the opportunity. So now we're gonna get into the point here where the, you can see here the Erie have set up in clearing one in the top left corner of the board. Uh, the board's flipped over at the moment because they're going from the perspective of the player. Um, so now I'm left with a really interesting decision. Okay, if, when I pick the otters, where do I set up? It's gonna be a very empty map in general. There's not going to be a lot of uh, other faction pieces because it's pretty much just the Eerie. You got a Vagabond and then the Moles uh, are just kind of spread out and put like lone pieces in some clearings and sometimes have a big buff clearing, but that's like it. Board's very empty and the Otters also, you generally want to keep your Otters in a ball. Uh, and it, just on that point, this does actually make our funds a little bit more valuable than other people's funds. I would say just because the map is so empty, it means we're likely going to be able to trade post with our funds a lot more freely than with other faction funds. That does, you still want purchases because you're not gonna get surplus funds, uh, which are surplus funds are funds that you receive on your turn that are greater than the amount you would receive via protectionism at the start of your turn. You're not gonna get surplus funds getting zero buys from anyone. So you still want people to buy so you can get some of those surplus funds. Um, but it means we want to be a little more careful as we go through this game and decide, you know, is a purchase really necessary? You don't actually always want people to buy from you as the otters. You are giving them an advantage, otherwise they wouldn't be buying. So I need to really ask, is that advantage worth, uh, is giving them that advantage and me losing this card, for example, worth the two funds I'm getting? Do I really need those two funds? So we're going to touch more on that question uh, later in the later in the video. So getting back to choosing my setup clearing, as the otters, you want to pay a lot of attention to what the suit of the clearing that you choose to set up in is, specifically because there are a lot of amazing crafts in the deck that you want to be taking advantage of, but you need specific trade posts out to be able to craft them. As a result, in general, your priority for trade posts is two rabbit and one mouse. This allows you to craft coins, boots, teas, and bags for large amounts of points, as well as giving you access to crafting coffin makers, League of Adventurous Mice, and when you have all three out, Propaganda Bureau. Now for those newer to the faction, I want to note that Fox trade posts are not as high on the list as Bunny and Mouse, because pretty much every item crafted in Fox is of a huge benefit to the Vagabond and is thus very dangerous, alongside the fact that there aren't any good crafted improvements for Otters in the Fox suit. Now if you were in a game without the Vagabond, and you happen to get a starting hand full of Fox craftables like the Anvil, the Crossbow, and the Sword, you could definitely bump the priority of Fox Trade Post by a lot and potentially focus on getting Fox Trade Posts out first. But in general, because there are no real good crafted improvements for Fox, you'd only really want to focus on Fox if you had a lot of Fox craftables in your starting hand. Now, since our priority for trade posts is two rabbit and one mouse most of the time, this means that we want to set up in a clearing in either of those two suits, as it will allow us to get trade posts out in one of those suits without having to move and waste actions. I will note that mouse trade posts are a little lower priority here because the Harrier is a very dangerous vagabond, particularly with T, so I want to be careful to not craft T for him. This makes rabbit clearings a bit higher priority than mouse and thus the highest priority on my list so far. But before we make any decisions, when you pick any faction, and this of course applies to the otters, it's important to factor in your starting hand. You would hope when picking otters in advance setup, you have a hand that is decent for them, that gives you some options of what you can do. While there are a lot of fantastic rabbit craftables that I can take advantage of in this matchup, aspirationally picking otters and then setting up in rabbit hoping for those great craftables is not a great idea. You want to make sure that when you pick the faction and again when you choose where you set up, you take your starting hand into account. Otters do have great card draw, which is why you still want to focus on getting your two bunny and one mouse trade post out because it's very likely you'll draw into some of those cards. But again, you don't want to have an awful starting hand for otters and just pick them anyways. You do really want to have some sort of guiding light in your starting hand that you're working towards early on into the game. 
So with that said, let's go ahead and look at my starting hand. You'll immediately notice that I started with Bake Sale, my favorite card in the game because of how freaking cute the art is. Um, and there's a little cake on it, <laughs> which is kind of hilarious, but I made a carrot cake just like this for my wife before I knew what this carrot cake looked like on the Bake Sale card, which is hilarious. But anyway, small tangent aside, uh, I have a high value rabbit craftable that immediately covers a quarter of the non uh, trade post points that I need, three out of the 12. Uh, I also have a sword, but at best it's a late game craft given I do not want to give Harrier another sword right now, or it's a purchase. Given these craftables, it only makes sense to start in a rabbit clearing to allow me to more easily craft coins. Now, touching on my hand draft really quick before I continue, I decide to drop the Rabbit Partisans and Rabbit Dominance. I obviously want to craft the coins, and I want to sell the two bird cards at best, or otherwise sell one and keep either the sword for late game craft, as I mentioned, or the bird ambush for policing insurance. But getting back to the topic at hand, Given my hand and the points I mentioned earlier about prioritizing rabbit clearings, I really do want to set up in Bunny. So getting back to this point in the VOD. But which rabbit clearing should I set up in? To make that decision, I recognize that I'm in a heavy racing matchup and I'll likely need to police all of these factions at different times. Since I don't know who and in what order they'll take off, it's important that I set up close to all of them so I don't need to waste actions moving over to them when I want to police. As a result, I also want to set up in a spot central on the board. So now given all of the above and all the conversation I just went through, I decide to set up in clearing 11. So, uh, skipping ahead to other people deciding to set up in different places, uh, let's go ahead and look at the board state. So, here's our initial board state. Uh, the moles set up, uh, starting their homeland clearing, clearing seven. Vagabond sets up in this forest here. Um, you know, not super surprising. Nothing super surprising about the setup, to be honest. Now, getting into what we're thinking before our turn one. So we really want to buy before our first turn to get our engine online. Again, this is a matchup when you do a lot of policing in. Uh, so we really just want to get surplus funds as soon as possible to allow us to do the policing we need to do. And then also keep up points wise, because I'm not getting any points from hitting the Vagabond and someone's going to have to do it. When you have a despot and moles in your game, it's pretty much just going to be you. So I'm like, hey, Harrier, you get a Vagabond gets a free buy. Something that's very important to remember when you're playing the Otters with Vagabonds is that whenever they come out of the forest, they get a quote unquote free buy because you exhaust items to buy at the start of your turn as the, at the start of Birdsong as a Vagabond, but then you immediately refresh after the refresh step comes after the buy step. So you can, they can buy something from you, exhaust items, and immediately refresh them. So I'm going to be aware of this. You want to pitch this sort of thing to Vagabonds um allow them to buy cards early and what i'm really looking is i'm like hey vagabond you know i, I want the vagabond to buy something that isn't the coins they're probably not going to buy the coins because they don't they likely don't have the hammer uh so i'm kind of hoping they buy the bird ambush because i don't like i like ambushes as the otters but two funds is infinitely more valuable to me than the bird ambush so i'm kind of hoping i can get them to buy the ambush and given the moles usually need to be hit pretty early you need to slow the moles down you need to make it annoying for them to be able to sway um the moles are a great bargaining chip for this so hey vagabond if you buy from me i'll hit the moles which is pretty much exactly what i say um and since hitting a lone mole or two will give me no points uh, i want an incentive to make this worth my while i don't want to just run around policing people for zero points and zero gain i want to say hey i will go police these people but can you buy because i'm in a bit of a rough spot i need these funds to be able to do so um, so if we can get the Vagabond to buy like one of our two bird cards, it will significantly speed up our game without losing a really valuable craft like the coins. 
Um, and again, we're not too worried about losing the sword due to not being able to craft it until our second to last or last turn. It's kind of something I was thinking maybe if no one buys it, I'll just hold on to it for a while uh, and then be able to craft it towards the end of, end of the game uh, because we don't want to supercharge the Harrier. And they do end up uh they do end up buying um which we'll see i think somewhere soon here uh, okay it's not that important to see i don't know exactly where it happens but yeah they do end up buying the bird ambush this is best case scenario for me exactly what i wanted them to buy um i i well i don't know if i can fully say that i was kind of okay with them buying the sword as well because if i need to police the vagabond that now means they have an ambush but in terms of points wise like i'm very happy they bought the ambush i can i know they have it so i can kind of prepare for it and it's not eating me out of any points so um i'm overall very happy with this and uh, i'm looking pretty good going into my first turn okay so i've skipped a little bit forward to my turn one we can see that we have uh, five funds here in the payments box. We got two from the Harrier buying out the ambush, which is fantastic. And I want to take a look at the board state. Um, we can see that the moles actually did something kind of unconventional. They were relatively new to the moles. This was their first time playing them. Uh, so they weren't aware of all of the meta mole strats. This is something you wouldn't see very often. Um, but they end up deciding to build turn one. Now, they did not actually sway. So losing the building isn't a big deal. And they kind of offset the card. Uh, because they did craft saboteurs, which was an interesting kind of play because they get around the possibility that someone um, crafts some really big craft and they can nuke it with their sabs now. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, but what it does do is it sets up a pretty juicy target. The moles need to be hit. And to keep our table credibility and slow them down, we want to hit them. Again, the river folk need 12 non-trade post points so getting two of those out of the way turn one is actually quite amazing for us now something interesting here is the birds actually offered to buy from me if i wiped the moles out of set out of seven um which was a great opportunity for me to agree to something I already wanted to do. And you'll remember I actually pitched this idea to the Vagabond to get the Vagabond to buy. And now the birds kind of opened up at the start of their turn. It was like, hey, otters, if you go and smack the moles, I'll buy from you. Um, they said they didn't really uh, care what price I set it to. Uh, but I didn't want to thrift them out of anything. It was likely they would go back on their word if I set it to four. So I decided to set my prices to... <clears throat> to three um now that said this did present an interesting opportunity for me because i since they were reaching out to me i framed it as more of a favor and i stipulated that they didn't buy coins because i wanted to craft it and i found this pretty important because i would rather not sell coins for three when i could craft it for three points um especially because when i buy it for three like yes i get the surplus fund which is amazing but coins would just be such a good way to supplement those 12 points that i need get a quarter of them out of the way really quick um and if the birds bought the bird card you know that that sword off me i'm not gonna be crafting a sword for a while so i really prefer the birds buy the sword the sword card because then you know they get their they get a bird card um I get three funds and I get to keep the coins. So, so yeah, they they agree to that proposal, um, which was fantastic for me. I was very happy. I took, you know, if someone approaches you with a deal, that's honestly amazing. And if you can swing that deal your way, that's fantastic. Uh, but again, as the otters, you also want to be looking for making your own deals. You don't want to stay silent and wait for people to do that because people generally don't it depends on the table sometimes people do people experience playing with the otters probably will but people that maybe haven't played as much at a competitive level may not just think of it so you also need to be prepared to make deals which is what i did with the vagabond and in this case i got kind of the best of both worlds so one of the things i see a lot with newer otters players is they like to put down trade posts really early uh, even if i have a craft that i want to that i I might craft. I really do not like trade posting on turn one because it it loses two two funds. Like every time you trade post, you're spending two funds, so you're you're knocking two of your funds out of the game permanently. Um, like you're not 
get like yes you're getting two funds every turn but the two funds you spent you're not getting back so you got to be really careful about when you're placing your funds and i usually never like to place any trade posts on the first turn so i can you know um keep tempo and keep my amount of actions going up you want to be careful about over trade posting so i got a fund advantage of two i got two surplus funds from the vagabond great but i don't want to give up that fund advantage and there's nothing again there's also nothing i can immediately craft so um even if there was i still wouldn't do it but yeah i have five funds i'm going to do something with it so i decide that i want to go in and hit clearing seven of course and because i'm not trade posting this does present the opportunity that maybe i roll in here and get ambushed uh, they did reveal two of their cards. They crafted Sabs. They revealed one card. It was like a boot or something. I don't quite remember. The third card could have been an ambush. So there is the possibility that I roll in here, get ambushed, and then roll like a 2-2 two -two and get wiped. But at the end of the day, if that happens, I'll just, I guess, recruit one otter and then smack these. Like, I'm not too worried that's likely they don't have an ambush. Um, so it felt safe enough. Um now, in general, as the otters, something you want to get used to is calculating what you need to do on a turn and then drawing cards with leftover funds. You generally want to draw before you do anything on your turn because you could pull up things such as ambush cards, which could be amazing for you because ambushes are great when you are policing. You know, if I draw the second bird ambush or a bunny ambush, I can feel safe going in against clearing seven because if I draw the bunny and they get the, and they had the bird or I drew the bird and they got, they had the bunny. Um, it means that if they ambush, I ambush. Otters are extremely valuable to the river folk company. Uh, recruiting is really not something you want to be doing very often because you're spending a fund for no like immediate gain. Um, and losing that fun for the rest of the game, of course. So don't want to be doing that a lot. And as a result, getting ambushed sucks. So having an ambush is fantastic. Um, so uh, I decided not to draw at the start of my turn in this case. I had five. I would need to spend or commit one fun to move to clearing seven along the river. Uh, and honestly, this was such a vital set of battles that I was worried about rolling poorly. Like, you know, let's say I drew two times because I know on average you roll a 2-1 when you're attacking. On average, I should move in here, hit a 2, and then clear it out. So I could have drawn twice, moved, and then double battled. But who's to say that's going to happen? Who's to say I don't roll a double double zero or a oh zero zero one zero 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 one one? Like, you never know when that's going to happen. And this was a vital opening turn. So I decided against drawing and just move straight in. I said the ambush risk. I don't think it's that great. If they do ambush by some miracle, then whatever, I'll deal with it. Uh, so I move in here and um, battle these two clearings. And I end up actually rolling a 3-0 uh, and then uh, something else to clear it up. You can see I move in here. I wipe wipe everything off. I get my two points, uh, which you see in a moment here. Um, okay, you don't, you don't actually see it because I'm kind of skipping through the replay. They don't, yeah, it's it's dropping down right here. Um, and you can see the point going to two. So pretty good. And then I have uh, two uh, funds left. So I decide actually to draw two cards now that I ended up with more funds left over. Again, that wasn't guaranteed, so I didn't want to do it. But yeah, I was able to draw twice. And unfortunately, I got uh, informants and tunnels, which both kind of suck pretty much completely useless for the otters i i do not like either of those cards so kind of unfortunate but we had a great overall we had a great opening turn being able to hit that clearing for two points and get two out of the 12 of those non-trade post points out of the way which uh, something to note in this matchup uh, non-trade post points are going to be pretty rare in terms of buildings like you've got the eerie roosts you've got mole buildings and tunnels which will be pretty few and far between vagabond doesn't give anything so it's pretty much just going to be crafting other than that so these points are very very important but yeah uh, that is my turn one all right so skipping ahead to turn two now uh, here's my board state I did, in fact, get the three payments from the birds as promised, and they bought the arms trader card off me, which was amazing. I get to keep my bake sale, and I have 
my five committed otters. So we've got eight funds. We've gotten three surplus funds by turn two. Absolutely great spot. I'm really glad that I'm in this position. However, we are nowhere near out of the woods in terms of the racing capabilities of the faction in this game. And this, even getting this, these two purchases, um, it's, it's still nowhere near like a dominant position, I would say. Um, we've got a lot of worrying to do and a lot of things to do. So let's see if I can get to the board state here. I think I end up I end up drawing a bunch. Um, I'd like to find the board state. So here we are. So here is the board state. Um, the commentators, given the amount of funds I have, I have eight funds. They pointed out a possible dividends play, which I could trade post in seven. I have my five otters and then go for three points of dividends, uh, which I briefly thought about. Uh, but... I personally only really like to go for dividends in an entangled game and if I already have a good hand. Um, an almost empty hand is, of course, bad for buys. And if I don't have an incredible hand, I generally see more value in the points and utility that could be earned from the cards I draw than I do in the three dividends points that I could gain. You know, we could draw cards like another coins or the hammer or tea that I could craft down the line or good crafted improvements like propaganda bureau, coffin makers, false orders. I could draw ambushes. Uh, my hand has a lot of room to improve and I see more value and potentially more points in that possible hand than I do in the dividends points. And additionally, another factor that I was considering was that the Harrier was probably going to start popping off eventually. Maybe they end up crafting a T. There was a T in the discard. There's a T in the decree, but you never know. And if they do, I'm going to have to police them. And so if I sit here going for dividends and then maybe craft coins next turn, I'm going to have a completely empty hand. I'm not going to have anything good in there. Who's going to buy? Um, and I'm not going to really be able to draw much on my next turn because maybe I have to police the Harrier. Uh, that's that's a problem. If I need to police, I want to have a good hand already to maybe encourage people to buy and make deals with people. If I got crap in my hand, informants and tunnels, who's going to buy from that? So a lot of reasons I considered for not deciding to go for dividends. Interestingly, the birds make an offer that if I spend two of their funds, they will buy again. This is an interesting offer. Uh, but you got to ask, okay, what am I going to do with that? Uh, how am I going to spend those two funds? Why am I going to spend those two funds? Uh, going into this turn, I haven't done anything, right? I just have my eight funds. Like, I don't want to just drop a bird TP for the hell of it. You really need to, as the otters, make sure that when you're dropping trade posts, you are either doing it because you need the warrior to circumvent an ambush risk, you need the warrior to move through rule, um, or you're crafting something, and this is generally the most important one, you're crafting something immediately with the trade post. Why would I drop a trade post and then craft something with it the next turn when I could have used the two funds on this turn to like draw cards and then drop it next turn. I got basically two additional actions by doing it in that way. So I don't just want to drop a bird trade post for the hell of it. Um, so the the birds had asked the question of like, you know, do you, do you want to craft the coins? And generally, I look at that and I say, no. Uh, burning four funds, I would need to drop two trade posts. So I have eight funds. I need to lose half my funds to craft coins. I really do not want to do that. I really shy away from dropping multiple trade posts on the same turn. The only time I do it is if I feel it is critical to our game to get something crafted. So, or like I really need to get warriors on the board, but I only need a few so I can get away with dropping trade posts instead of recruiting, which gives us points for the recruits, which is nice. Um, but generally, I really don't like to drop multiple trade posts on the same turn. It really kills your tempo. You know, you go from having 10 funds to six funds, or in my case, eight funds to four, which is a huge dip, you know. Uh, so I really don't want to be dropping two trade posts to craft coins. Um, so since the birds right now are only in bunny clearings, though, uh, I'd want to actually be doing something with the bunny trade post I dropped uh, before deciding to drop it. 
again i don't want to drop trade post for the hell of it um so this turn i don't feel like i need to police the harrier they're doing they're doing okay um the moles i already policed them i don't feel like i need to police them immediately They've kind of been knocked down a little bit. And the birds are in a stable position. They haven't gone double build or anything at this point in the game. Uh, so now I want to go back to what I ended up doing on my turn. So I decide... Um, we just kind of go back. I decide to draw cards. This is generally because there's no immediate policing target. And I have a lot of room to improve my hand here. I have a coins, but... You know, I could draw more craftables. I could draw really good crafted improvements, high policing matchups, stuff like Propaganda Bureau, False Orders, um, sometimes Corvid Planners, uh, League of Adventurous Mice, and then other craftables like boots, bags, teas. Even if I don't want to craft a tea immediately, if the Harrier like crafts a tea and then I craft a tea after that, that's not super bad. So there's a lot of room to improve my hand. So I would, I really want to um, increase the amount of cards that are in my hand. So I decided to go for some drawing. I draw once, I get a root T. Now, this is a really interesting point here. Um, the birds actually point out, they were like, you know, they agreed to buy again if I spent two of their funds. But now they actually, now that there's T, this presents a problem because if the Vagabond buys the T, a Harrier with T is significantly scarier than a Harrier without T. Um, so the birds actually make an offer of okay you know what i'm actually gonna buy the tea instead and lock it up in my decree which is fantastic because i'm not gonna craft it immediately it's the points are really nice but i don't want to craft it immediately for the harrier unless the harrier crafts their own tea and it means i get out of the birds buying my bake sale because they made it clear they wanted to buy my bake sale and i did not want them to so the fact that i drew a tea was actually low-key amazing for me um so I decide to keep drawing. We get a crossbow. We get charm offensive. Now, this is interesting because the birds said they would buy again if I dropped the trade post with their funds. Um, and now I'm like, okay, there's a use to dropping the bunny trade post. And as a result, I'm going to drop one and then craft charm offensive. So I basically, I, I go, I do five draws and I get a second coins. Now, this is amazing. I, I, I go through all my draws um, and I think I draw one more time after some chatter and i get eerie emigre which is a bird card so good for birds potentially but not amazing for me or really anyone else at the table um so the birds make an interesting offer here they say if i set the price to two they will buy twice and they would buy the t to deny it and they would buy out a coins because i'm looking at this and i say okay i'm ditching informants and tunnels and i'm crafting charm offensive i have three funds left so I, I at this point actually i had dropped a trade post and then i crafted charm offensive um <clears throat> i dropped my trade post along the river because i wanted to make it easy to move this otter uh over if i needed to move up the otter ball um or to group the otter ball together that would be much more possible because it's along the river um but yeah, so they make the offer, do I buy twice for two? Uh, additionally, something to note is the birds actually crafted swap meat on their turn. This is a problem for me. I hate swap meat as the, uh, facing swap meat as the otters. It's very, very dangerous because uh, it means people can, they, they know what's in my hand so they can aim, try and get those cards out of my hand. So I'm in this interesting predicament, you know, do I say yes I'm going to set my price at two and the birds buy twice. And what do they buy? Root T and coins. So <clears throat> personally, I do not want to lose the coins for uh, two funds. You can argue, yes, I'm getting four funds and two of those funds are surplus. But I would much rather um, get a purchase for three funds and then have both coins left over. Because, yeah, it's, it's one less surplus fund, but I have an extra card I can craft for three points. Or someone else buys it on this turn as well and ends up getting me additional funds, which um, we'll talk about after. But So what I end up deciding to do, since coins are six out of the 12 points I need and I really want to hold on to them, and they were going to buy the root T anyway, is I decide no I do not want to accept that deal. And this is where, as the otters, you kind of want to think about every single 
um, decision you're making and deal you're making and not just blindly accepting deals because people are buying. You really want to decide, you really want to ask yourself, you know, what is the value to this? Like, what am I getting if I don't do this? And what am I getting if I do do this? And in this case, I decided that a purchase for three and then me keeping two coins with the possibility they get swap meted, it would be a 50-50 at that point because they would buy and then and then they would swap meet after the buy. Um, there's a 50-50 chance I keep the keep one of the coins and that's really what I was betting on or that I keep both the coins, which is kind of what I was betting on. So, you know, you could argue for doing the two buys at two, but I really wanted to take the chance and keep the coins. Uh, so that's just, that is what I end up deciding to do. Um, and thankfully, the coins do not get swap meted off me. Uh, <clears throat> I actually, I use Charm Offensive going into evening, and I draw a League of Adventurous Mice, and then my hand ends up being Crossbow, Eerie, or uh, Bake Sale, Root Tea, Investments, League of Adventurous Mice. I kick out the Eerie Emigre, the Informants in the Tunnels. Um, and they end up buying Root Tea and then swap meeting League of Adventurous Mice off me, which is the one I cared the least about, even though League of Adventurous Mice is pretty good for otters. Um, but yeah, so overall, not too bad. Uh, I end up in a pretty good spot. This is my ending hand. And then we go into the bird's turn. They end up buying the root T, uh, and then they, uh, they swap meat, which we didn't quite see here. Um, let's see if I can find it. Yeah. They, uh, they, there, there it is right there. Yeah. So I, I noticed he, he actually forgot to give one back after he swap meted almost became a steel meat as the commentators say here. Um, and he actually gives me false orders back. So this is something I want to point out. Uh, I got false orders, uh, very good card in a policing matchup, especially when we're talking about moles. If they end up building false orders, Card to keep an eye on. So I'll touch more on that later when I go into my next turn. Um, but yeah, so looking pretty good after my turn and after the bird's turn, getting, you know, not getting uh, swap meted, not losing my coins, getting the purchase for three anyways. The T gets locked up. Amazing. Great for me. So I want to touch a little bit on the bird's turn two here. Um, so... Let's see if I can go to the bird's turn. Um, they, let's see, where's the decree? So this is what the decree looks like. Uh, they contemplate out loud they, starting a double build because they're like, oh, you know, it's pretty racy. Like I'll probably need to, you know, maybe start going for a double build. And <clears throat> this is bad for me if they decide to do this because it adds a third faction to the points race. So what I tell them, because I don't want them to do this, I don't want to add another faction to the points race. I tell them, that would leave a lot of lightly defended roosts for the Harrier to eat because you don't have a lot of recruits as despot. Um, so you're going to be moving and just double building, double building. Um, so that gives a lot of roosts for the Harrier to eat, um, which is true. But really, I just wanted to give them a reason to not double build just yet. And... It ends up paying off and they decide not to double build. This is huge for me because it slows the game down and keeps it moving at that slower pace that I can keep up with. You know, it, it means I'm not as rushed to try and police the Eerie along with the Vagabond, which I know I'm probably going to need to police soon and potentially the moles again. I can't police everyone at the same time. So I, I want at least one faction that's not racing for the moon immediately to keep the game kind of in balance and that's why i'm very happy i kind of won that quote unquote won that uh, table talk duel there of convincing him not to do that um so yeah coming out of uh the end of turn two i'm feeling very good i got my two coins um got my two coins in my hand i got the purchase for three birds aren't double building things are looking looking pretty good but again tenuous board position like we still have some very notable threats at the table and this game is by no means a write-off so now we're going to move on to turn three all right so again skipping ahead to turn three starting the turn i have six payments 
three from the birds who bought the root tea off me as agreed and the moles who decided to buy bake sale off me on their turn. Now, one thing I will say, uh, this many payments a turn, not seen super often at higher levels of play, but I can see the moles reasoning. Uh, if we go and look at the board state here, the moles have actually set up shop in 11 and they were only able to do this because they bought bake sale off me. They revealed it to as a daylight action to build an 11. And then they used the formal that they swayed last turn. I didn't mention that, but they swayed formal last turn to build again in clearing 11. And then they crafted the coins uh, for three points. So um, I, I really see the reason they did this. I don't think it was necessarily a bad play. Um, they can, you know, they, they used it to build. They got three points off the purchase. Uh, they because they can craft it and not only is the meta not doing the otters any favors but a racy matchup kind of sucks and so you know getting it off the otters and denying the otters the three of those points you know is not actually the end of the world now the otters love the three surplus funds i would absolutely i will absolutely take that trade especially because i had the second coins but again i see the reasoning um now with that said victory is nowhere near assured despite having this many payments i'm getting a little worried the bulls have a really strong clearing here now here now um so the harrier and other stuff to worry about which speaking of which after denying t from the harrier and having a t in the discard as well they actually did have the third t and they were able to craft it this turn and get quite a few points they uh, knocked out the bird roost uh that i believe was in 10 and they're up to 11 on turn three and everyone else is kind of lagging behind like the next highest is the you know moles at six now again we haven't all taken our turns yet like i and birds haven't taken my turn yet but we're certainly not getting to 11 on our turn so they're speeding ahead here um so with all this said i think that this kind of shows the strength of deciding to get a better hand and not going for dividends as well as making sure to only let the birds buy the root tea and not the coins as well. Um, the moles were incentivized to buy the coins um, because I still had bake sale specifically in my hand. Um, and I ended up with six payments in a turn and I still have a coins to craft for myself. So I, I think I made the right play not going for dividends. Um, and I, I think it really did pay off, even though I couldn't have foreseen all the events that happened. Um, now, bird swap meet resulted in me losing leave of Ventress Mice, but he handed me false orders, as we know, which is amazing. Because now that the moles have set up like this, I might want to consider crafting false orders. Um, so they have two buildings and a tunnel. Really good for me in the event that I can crack that because I can get three non-trade post cardboard points but it's probably not happening this turn because six moles defending it with you know i could maybe bring my otters up here bring this otter down here down here into 11 swing swing if he ambushes me i'm in huge trouble so i i'm want to be wary of that um so as i don't know if he has an ambush did he draw one on his last turn i don't know um does does he been hiding one in his hand who knows um <clears throat> So it's it's really dangerous, and I just kind of don't feel like wiping my otter ball off the board is very important or is very good for me right now. And additionally, the Harrier is quite a big problem. So one of the reasons I gave for not going for dividends last turn is that I wouldn't have much of an opportunity to focus on getting a good hand this turn due to possibly needing to police the Vagabond, which is exactly what happened now that said before i go and police the vb i want to draw some cards this is because i know the vb has a bird ambush that they bought for me on turn one and i want to see if i can luck into drawing the other bird ambush or a mouse ambush so that i can counter ambush and spare my otters so before i did this i calculated what i needed to do on my turn as follows and again this is very important as the otters you want to be drawing first most of the time and there's you know, a few cases where i don't in this game and i'll explain that but uh, you want to calculate what you need to do and then see how much room you have to draw so i started the turn with 12 funds i want to i have one bunny trade post down i want to craft the coins get it out of my hand get the three points secured 
So I want to trade post in seven where I am for two points. I don't want to spend the bird funds. Um, I you you generally want to have some of other factions funds in late going into the late game because it allows you if you get wiped off the map to easily trade post with them. Um, so I don't want to use bird funds, but I want to TP with my own funds for two. I want to craft the coins for two. And again, this is sticking to what I talked about earlier in the video where I, I don't want to be dropping more than one trade post a turn. I dropped one trade post on turn two to craft charm offensive. So I got value out of it. And then I dropping a second trade post to craft the coins, getting value out of it and only using one trade post a turn. I never really like to do two or more on um, very rare situation, but yeah, I'm keeping tempo with that, not losing too many funds and getting more funds because of uh, the surplus funds I'm getting from purchases. Um, so I need to TP for two. I need to craft coins for two. I'm down now to eight funds. I want to move twice to get to the VB. I'm down to um, <clears throat> six funds. I need to battle at least twice, hoping to deal two sets of good hits, as I believe that is what it will take for them to forest. So I'd like to roll... Uh, like a three zero or a three one or something like that and then like a two or something and i feel like that will be enough to force them and it will be noted i would it will get another otter from trade posting here so I'll have five otters even though they have the ambush if i don't draw an ambush i'll still be down to three and can roll my max hit immediately um so as a result you know doing all that i i budget three funds to hit the vagabond in case i get like a zero zero or something really bad like a one zero 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 one one so i budget three funds for that and this means TP for two, craft for two, move for two, uh, budget three for hitting the Vagabond. That's nine. And then I have three funds left over. And these are the funds that I will use to draw at the start of my turn. As Garrett calls out, got enough funds to do this. So I get swap meet. Interesting for me. I really like having swap meet as the otters, but I don't know if I'll get to craft it. I'm not going to be able to craft it this turn. Um... So, got swap meat. I actually get the third coins, which is kind of hilarious, but one of the coins has already been crafted by the mole, so not important for me. Um, and then I get woodland runners. So I get a pair of boots and a bird card, which could be good for the birds if they decide to purchase again, which they probably won't at this point. Um, <clears throat> but it's good because it's, it's a point. It's a point that I could get. That's not from trade posts. So, fortunately, don't draw the... Hopefully, the wishful thinking prophesied ambush, but that's all right. Um, and yeah, so the turn uh, goes pretty much as expected. I don't draw the ambush, which kind of sucks, but I move into 10. I get ambushed by the Harrier. You can see I went from 5 to 10 otters, or 3 otters. I end up actually rolling a 3-0 and then a 2-1. So I get left with 2 otters in the clearing. Uh, and this left the Harrier with just 2... Uh, two undamaged swords um which yeah we can see here and their bag um i did not feel like they were going to destroy their momentum of spending an entire turn just to use two swords to hit me the otters or go and try and hit the eerie for a maximum of like four points when they could go into the forest and then have like a huge turn coming out of the forest especially if they roll poorly imagine they roll like one zero one zero and get like two points and then they damage their own items in the process uh, like it would be really rough. So I didn't think they were going to do that. So I decide to draw again and I end up actually drawing a mouse and a sack. And then I use the charm offensive again. And I, I don't remember exactly who I charm offensive, but I was kind of charm offensing the factions that I felt were going a little slowly. So I charm offensive the moles and I charm offensive the eerie. I never charm offensive the harrier because too worried about him. Um, but the moles, they had, you generally do not charm offensive the moles. I want to say that, but because they did something a bit suboptimal on their first turn and had their building destroyed and did not sway on their first turn, I felt it was okay to give them one point. And the Eerie, since they did not double build yet, I feel like that wasn't too bad either. So uh, ending my turn, feeling pretty good. I got my coins craft down. I only used two funds. I am now five out of 12 of the point of the non-trade post points that I needed. And so overall, you know, I'm not in too bad of a position. So that is my turn three. All right, so skipping ahead to the top of round four. This is the look at our board. These are the cards we have. Some decent craftables here. A lot of stuff that I would like to craft. 
and we have 10 funds spread throughout our commitments and two more incoming funds in our payments that have not been placed yet. Jumping to the board state, we can see um, that the moles have built their third citadel in clearing 11, which is relatively unorthodox. Not the fact that they're building because this is, especially without the God of War, with it being a despot leader, uh, this isn't a faction matchup that can like super easily break through this many moles. So it's not super dangerous to build per se with this many moles. But three citadels is pretty unorthodox because you typically run out of recruits very quickly. So you'd probably want one of those to be a market. But anyways, moles have three buildings and what this means is they've swayed earl of stone as well so they're able to score a minimum of three points a turn plus they could sway for another two or three points every turn and that's not counting any cardboard any crafting um really anything else they're doing uh you know they could sway banker and then start bankering cards uh this is a bit of a problem um, additionally, I am still worried about the Vagabond, as although we have forested him, uh, he will likely have a strong turn coming out of the forests. On top of all that, the birds have two builds as of their last turn and can now join the race in full. So in short, I am well-funded, but now very scared. I still need seven non-trade post points, and there's very few of them on the map. Most of the crafting is gone. Uh, you can pretty much consider the four red craftables gone as well at the moment because I'm not going to craft swords, anvil, or a crossbow for the harrier at this point in the game. Yes, they could be late game crafting, so that's important to note. Um, it's not completely gone, but as for where I'm getting the seven points, it's looking a little dubious, we can say. Um the moles have an unbreakable, what looks like an unbreakable clearing. And in, we're just looking at a big old race, and it's not ideal. Now that said, false orders being in my hand is something I'm really looking at crafting to help deal with this unbreakable looking clearing. Maybe, just maybe, I can pull something off to break through and get to that juicy four cardboard points. If I can wipe it, that would put me at nine non-trade post points, which is much more doable. Now, at this point in the game, we're all kind of talking about needing to hit the moles. The Harrier is kind of dodging the responsibility and saying, hey, I've just been forested. Um, you know, I'd like to go and do my own thing for a turn and then I can come hit the moles. And while I kind of see why he's making this argument, because it's not in his benefit to go hit the moles, it's also in my mind just pure uh, table talk because... Yes, he's been forested, but he's still pretty much in the lead um, and is going to have a very strong turn if he's allowed to do his own thing next turn, which by the time he gets to the end of his next turn and he's like, all right, I'm ready to police the moles, we're probably going to be at a point where we need to come and hit the Harrier again because they're at a ton of points or they've gained a ton of points. So, yeah, so it's really me and the birds looking at cracking the mole clearing. Um the birds actually offered to buy a bird card if I gave them two of their funds funds back. And then that way they could put it in battle and then help with the mole stronghold. Um, I do agree to giving two of their funds back because I see I need to drop a trade post to craft false orders. Um, and they, the birds have a roost in four, which is a fox roost that I can drop a trade post on. So that kind of works out. Um, so I'm thinking about that. Now, one other thing to say, though, while I want to cooperate with the birds to hit this clearing, realistically, with false orders, I might actually be able to break through on my own, and I want to be the one taking this cardboard. I do not want me and the birds to hit the clearing and then the Harrier to come in and pretty much win the game off this the cardboard. I really don't want the Despot getting it either because that's a ton of cardboard points as well. Um, Especially if the Despot, like... Uh, you know, if all the warriors are dead and the despot like marches some warriors out, so there's only one left and then rolls a max of two hits, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, three points, three points, six points just off this. Like, that's huge. So I want to be the one to take out this cardboard. I really need non trade post points right now. So before I do any of what I was just talking about, as usual, I need to, I need to calculate what I'm doing on my turn. So I can't breach the mole base. VB is in the forest and the Eerie have some decently defended roosts. Um, since I can't dividends because I have loan trade posts, 
and my hand isn't that fantastic it's like okay there's some okay craftables but like i can't craft a crossbow i've got one point craftables um and so my hand's not fantastic there's also not a lot of free cardboard i decide to just draw and see what i get now just as it is important to calculate what you need to do on your turn and then draw at the start of your turn, as I was talking about last turn, you also want to keep an eye on what important cards have not been seen yet that might be worth digging for. Of course, this also relies on you knowing what cards are important for your game, um, but that comes with experience. One card that is extremely valuable in games where you need to police heavily is Propaganda Bureau, as it provides a source of quote-unquote free recruits, since you really want to avoid recruiting at all costs. Now, I say at all costs, like you, there are some cases where recruit actually makes a lot of sense. You just really don't want to be recruiting if you can avoid it, because to recruit, you have to spend a fund. And spending a fund kind of sucks as the otters because you lose it for the rest of the game. So if there's any other way to get recruits, like putting down a trade post for points, that's amazing. And Propaganda Bureau, in my opinion, is one of, if not the best card for the Riverfolk Company, just because of how sustainable it makes your otter ball every single turn you get at least one otter and not only are you getting an otter but you can use it to reduce the defenses of an enemy clearing um or get rule of a clearing if there's only one warrior in it so that you can trade post if you need to with your own funds for those that may not be aware propaganda bureau allows you to spend a card to replace an enemy warrior with your own warrior in a clearing matching the card. So, I have not seen Propaganda Bureau in the discard, and so I'm honestly looking at this turn, I'm coming in and I'm like, bro, I would love to get Propaganda Bureau. I've got a ton of funds. Let's see if we can snag it. So we're going to skip forward a bit. You can see I've got my two payments in here. Um, and let's see. Ooh, okay. Gather funds. So I'm going to gather funds and... Kind of skipping through this a little bit. Uh, I'm organizing all my funds. I like to do this a little bit in TTS um, to kind of just make it abundantly clear what pairs of two I have, um, what pairs of two like funds I have, so that it's it's very clear what I can trade post with and what I can't. But yeah, let's uh, let's play a little bit of the vod here. Uh, so first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna commit one more fund to draw. That is exactly what I wanted to see. That's a good card. It's a good card. Places things up a little bit. That that's that. It's an expensive craft for otters, but it can okay. really open up their game in the long run because it's a it's a recruit that doesn't require spending a fund. It requires committing a fund effectively. So here's the. Yeah. So all what Garrick just said, and I think when he when he says commit, he means commit to let's say draw a card and then you can use that card to um, get a recruit on the board but one of the really nice things that you already have a lot of cards and let's say items are crafted out or it's kind of it's kind of useless um or whatever card you have is kind of useless you can just use that card for free to get an otter on the board so absolutely fantastic i'm so happy with this draw and this really changes up my turn because now i have to ask myself okay um the moles used last turn one thing that i should say is the moles did sabo the swap meat off the eerie which i had been trying to get them to do for a little bit um so i'm very happy they finally did it and this opens up a window for me to craft false orders but now i'm in a weird position where i have two trade posts down and i want to craft false orders and propaganda bureau um so i <laughs> yeah i'm in, I'm in a i'm in a bit of a weird spot now, before, before I continue, uh, let's just go over what I'm doing with the rest of my funds here. Uh, I draw a bunny ambush. This is fantastic because it actually gives me ambush protection if I were to go for that mole stronghold, uh, as it is in a bunny uh, clearing. And I do not know where the rest of the bird ambushes are. So uh, I think we've seen one, if I recall, at this point in the game. I don't quite recall. Um but there is one unaccount, at least one unaccounted for. So bunny ambush, you love to see it. Um, 
So I end up, I was debating for a while, false orders, propaganda bureau, false orders, propaganda bureau. If I'm going to be taking out 11, we need to do it pronto. And I want to be the one to do it. So, and, and in order to do it, I want to have both of those cards. So I'm pretty happy with the draws. And I dropped the Fox TP to craft False Orders, which is the first priority. I ended up deciding False Orders first priority. I'm not going to break through that clearing with just Prop Bureau. I really need False Orders. And then I drop a Mouse TP with my own funds so that I can craft Propaganda Bureau. So this is one of the rare situations where I, I drop two TPs on the same turn. Um, it's a little unconventional. You don't see dropping tps with your own you don't see two tps in the same turn very often because it loses a lot of funds however i was i did have uh, quite a few surplus funds and i really really felt like it was vital to craft both because not only could i propaganda bureau this turn for an extra warrior i could also propaganda bureau next turn where i intend to attack the moles on top of having my false orders ready so i get an additional otter and then more funds next turn to use uh, to actually storm the stronghold since I won't have to commit three to craft propaganda bureau next turn. So this is one of the rare cases where I actually drop two trade posts. Um, <clears throat> so I chose a mouse trade post because that's where my otters are and I have no mouse trade post down yet. Uh, and I also have a bag that I could craft with that mouse trade post next turn if it does not get crafted in the meantime. So... I do, I drop two trade posts, propaganda, craft propaganda bureau, craft false orders. Um, and so I've done all that. I have a few funds left. Um, and all I do with the rest of those funds is uh, draw once and then move this otter from uh, four to the clearing in seven, I believe is what I end up doing. Um, so let me just skip forward here. You see I have two funds left that I have not committed. So, yep, I just moved from four to seven, and I don't believe I actually, oh, I, yeah, I moved from four to seven, but then I used Propaganda Bureau. So, um, I used Propaganda Bureau with, uh, I don't remember what card. I think it might have been Woodland Runners. Yeah, I used Woodland Runners to Propaganda Bureau uh, because the boots had been crafted out, unfortunately, by the Vagabond, which sucked, but oh well. Uh, now, also to note, my last draw was a sword, which is great for me because while I can't craft it this turn, I can craft it in the late game for a two-point burst, which is really amazing. But I don't want to enable the Harrier right now. So for now, it works towards my eventual 12 non-trade post points. Now, I want to mention something very important here at the end of my turn. Um, circling back, the birds had offered to buy a bird card for two if I spent their funds. However, they also wanted to make it contingent on the fact that I gave their funds back the following turn. So while I did spend their funds this turn because, you know, I don't really care about the bird funds too much right now because of how open the map is. I honestly, like I just said, don't really care about bird funds that much. So the, the map is empty. Uh, being able to drop a TP with bird funds is useless, especially considering the only other one I could drop right now is a bunny trade post, uh, which I already have two of. And I very, very rarely ever uh, drop three trade posts of the same type until your end game burst because it really neuters your end game options if you max out three of the same suit of trade post. Um. So, yeah, I don't want to do that. And basically, if I agree to this deal, I would A, lose a craftable crossbow uh, because that's what the birds would buy. I would B, not get any real benefit out of the bird funds because I have to spend them immediately. C, being forced to spend those bird funds immediately in order to keep my table credibility uh, is not ideal. And then D... Uh, I would make the birds stronger because they do get a bird card, which does make them stronger. So as a result, I end up deciding to price at three and say, hey, you know, I, I don't really need their funds. Uh, I will also say 
I don't want like the Harrier coming out of the forest and like buying my sword out for two or anything. That was another consideration. But really, it just came down to um, I would lose a craftable. The birds would get stronger. Uh, I don't really get a benefit out of having bird funds and I would be forced to spend them immediately, which I don't want to do. I don't want to be forced to spend funds on my next turn because I'm going to be storming a base. I don't I'm not dropping funds for the hell of it because I don't get any use, especially like that's another thing. You know, I'm not getting use out of those birds funds. Like I drop them for no reason, really, unless he gets a fox, uh, another fox clearing and I can craft a sword. But again, like committing four funds to their spending two and committing two when I need to storm this base and need a bunch of move actions and battle actions, not ideal. So yeah, that is my turn for what I end up doing. And overall, I'm feeling pretty decent. I didn't make a ton of points gains, but we got some huge crafts in and we're ready to get some work done on the next turn. All right, so here we are at the top of turn five. Nothing really changed. This is what my board looks like. I got two incoming payments that have not been placed down yet. And now I'm going to skip forward to what the board state looks like. So the Harrier has just come out of the forest and has had an incredible seven point turn. They're in a very good spot and I am falling behind. I table talked with the moles. This is important. Telling them that I would give them some funds back if they hit the vagabond, which I was willing to do at the time. However, they were only able to battle the VB once and only dealt a hit or two. So I wasn't actually sure if I'd end up honoring that promise. I didn't realize that they had actually been hadn't set up super well and didn't haven't really many battles to actually hit the VB. And it was like a one zero or a two one or something. Uh, and the VB barely took any damage. So I was like, oh, OK, maybe I don't actually honor that deal. Um, now, that said, I can't you know, I'm not just going to be like, no, you know, Whenever that kind of thing happens, you want to explain it in a way that doesn't make the other person spiteful. So we'll probably get back to that later. Um, but now, so at the start of my turn, the birds ask if I would consider giving their birds back. Now, at this point, we're getting into the late game and I'm decently fed. The likelihood of someone buying again is low. And those that do buy would just like last turn kind of stipulate that they would buy for two. Uh, and I'd have to probably like spend them immediately or uh, they could just lie and then not buy at all. Um, so likelihood of some buying again is low. As a result, I do not want to drop TPs with other factions funds unless I need to. Right now, I'd like to save them for the late game TP burst. Every fund you don't spend now is a fund you can commit to do something now and then spend later. So therefore, I am right now not in the business of dropping TPs to appease other players. We're kind of past the point of goodwill. Um, so just because someone asked to spend their funds, no, I'm not going to do it, especially because I don't believe they'll buy anyways. Um, that said, I try to do it in a polite way so as to make the reasons I'm not dropping them sound reasonable and not make the other players spiteful. So I told the birds I would not be returning their funds as I did not know how long it was going to take to break through the moles as I needed to collect all my otters together and then battle who knows how many times. It was likely that I could drop a TP with the birds and that I would have enough, but I really didn't want to. And that makes it sound more reasonable. So the birds player is like, oh, okay, you know what? That kind of makes sense. Um, okay. So that out of the way, you know, looking, continuing to look at the board state here. Um, everyone has a pretty stable point engine, but I still do need seven non-trade post points in order to make up the 12. And given the moles need to be dealt with anyways, as I was starting to plan last term, cracking, clearing 11, and clearing up all four pieces of cardboard would be amazing for me and takes it off the map for anyone else being able to do the same. Um, so after doing some calculations, because of my propaganda bureau last turn, there is actually only 10 defenders. I can false orders five of them out, propaganda bureau a sixth, and move my otters from um, five and then 10 in. So I end up with five otters on top of them. And then Propaganda Bureau, so that leads to six otters versus four, um, four moles, 
with four pieces of cardboard and I have a bunny ambush to protect myself, which is fantastic. If I didn't have the ambush, I'd probably move an additional guy from seven uh, in to do that, um, who I'd moved closer last turn. However, before I do this, someone needs to deal with the Harrier because I can't just hit the moles and then let the Harrier win. Um, the moles tried to hit the Harrier and unfortunately they didn't do a very good job. So I table talk the birds because, you know, birds and I are talking and we're like, hey, you know, we are kind of the farthest behind right now. Like we've got some ground to make up. You know, I believe I can deal with the moles as they're closer to me. I have false orders and propaganda bureau. I can wipe the moles if you want to hit the Harrier. So I table talk the birds into policing the Harrier while I police the moles. Um... The birds would get their points from roosts because they still have their passive scoring engine. Additionally, like just being real with the birds, like, hey, like, you know, like I could maybe make it all the way across the table, but I get zero points from that. Uh, you know, move. I have to spend all these actions moving all the way over there, hit the bagamon, get no points. Versus if I went after the moles, at least I would get compensated and you already get passive scoring from the double build you're going to do, getting you up to like six roosts and four point at uh, four additional points. Um so um that said it probably would pay the birds more to be greedy but it does really uh, help us to have someone hit the area and it's great if it's not me doing so so with that settled i decide to false orders the moles from 11 into 12 i was going to false orders them to like three but the moles player spoke up and said hey if i'm going to get wiped anyways why don't you put me on 12 so i can hit a roost and i'm like you know what good point so that's perfectly fine. I decide not to draw on my turn because all the T's and coins and stuff are accountable are accounted for. I have good craftables in my hand. I have an ambush that I need. Uh, there's not really any other good crafted improvements that I'm, I need to dig for right now. Um, and additionally, I have no idea how I like I truly do have no idea how long it's going to take me to break through the moles uh, if I roll poor, poorly. So I end up deciding not to draw ahead of time. So, go into the turn with 10 funds. I commit two funds to move my otters. Uh, there's the false orders. Move the otters from 5 into 10, and then 10 into 11. And then I propaganda bureau with swap meat. I would have liked to craft it, but I really just didn't want to waste time drawing and maybe getting mouse or fox or any other cards. Uh, so I just decided to use it for a prop bureau. Um, and then we start battling. So... Let's see if I can get to the point where I begin battling. Commit a fun to battle. Would you like to ambush? We're not doing the trade post in 11 before the battle. All right. And yep, as you can see called out there, I'm not doing the trade post before the battle. I decide not to spend the moles funds. Kind of go back on my word a bit because, again, I don't want to be dropping f trade posts for the hell of it right now. I will counter. <laughs> moles do have the bird ambush, which is important, and I am able to counter that with the bunny ambush. So not only... um. Do I get protected? But the moles lose a card, which is important because the moles really care about their cards. And ambush foiled. You knew the counter ambush was coming, but you could just want to get rid of it. Why does that happen so often against moles? Yeah. So opening with a zero zero, unfortunate. But these are the kind of rolls where I was like, okay, you know, I need to break through this clearing. So I got to budget as many funds as possible. Who knows how many zero zeros or bad rolls you might roll? Again. Are magical. Using a mole. Would you like to ambush? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> this is why we needed all of the warriors. Right. Right, have... Yep, and as Lily correctly pointed out, this is why we needed all of the warriors. This is why, uh, like, another reason why I don't want to be TPing. I don't want to TP with birds. I don't want to TP with moles. Like, if I'm TPing, like I'm down to like four battles, and that's starting to look sketchy with how bad these rules are. So I really, really, really needed to uh, just hold on to these warriors badly. Six more battles? Nope. The, the mole goes to the coffin. Oh, yes. And yes, yeah, something to point out is the birds did actually craft coffin makers, which I'm a little concerned about, but not super concerned about at the moment. Um,. Because they're kind of behind and there's not like after this turn, there really won't be that much like tons of warriors dying leading to a huge coffin. After this turn, it'll be most of the value they get from it. So 
Here we go. Sorry, that was two moles, correct? Yep, one. One for the Propaganda Bureau. Oh, yeah. Prop Bureau. Yep. Prop Bureau. Oh, those coffin makers. All right, in battle again. Don't worry, you're going to sabo it next turn, right? Yes, that's true. Oh, yep, true. so We're another bad roll. Going. We are, as Lily says, we are slowly grinding through the mole forces, one mole at a time. Am I going to get a chance with cardboard? <laughs> Uh, Luke, it has gone up, I want to say. So something I want to note, um, rolls and root, I mean, you know, they, they go, they go good, they go bad. Uh, I had some really good rolls early against the Vagabond. I get my bad rolls against the Mole, so it does happen. Okay, let's see. But I don't know. I moved twice. Pain. Just pain. Here I'm kind I of twice. I battled how many times? making sure that I committed enough funds. I didn't actually make any commitment mistakes this game, which I was very happy with. Times three times. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's Did right. You... Actually, I'm not sure. Did you recruit no. at all? No. Did not recruit. All right. Right. Gonna battle again. Using an otter. We're not losing any otters. Would you like to ambush? Maybe one day. Nope. We'll just keep doing. Just keep doing this, man. Come on threes. There, there we go. Yeah, so finally get the rolls I want um, and manage to break through. And at this point, the moles player is an interesting decision because he can choose to remove the tunnel. And then if I stay with this many warriors, as long as I roll a two, I would take out all three buildings at once and he would only suffer a single price of failure. Um, so at this point, there's three buildings remaining. And I have four funds. After some table talk, it is pointed out what I just said. I could move all otters except one out of the clearing and then attack. And at maximum, I roll two hits because of one hit plus defenseless. And so I could actually trigger price of failure twice. Um, and I decide to do this to further hamper the moles and really just, you know, if this ends up coming back to bite me at the end, uh, <laughs> I would feel real bad. So I didn't want to risk that. So I move battle twice. Uh, and then, yeah, so there's quite a lot of talk about that. I decided to do it um, and then draw once more with my final fund, uh, which I don't believe ends up actually having any significance. Yeah, I draw, I draw soup kitchen. So not fantastic. Um, but anyways, so you'll remember from earlier, I decided I'm saving other faction funds and not dropping TPs for no immediate reason at this point in the game. And as I have said, this does mean I'm going back on my deal with the moles. But I blow it off as a, I'm sorry, I ended up needing the funds to break through and couldn't return them. Now, it does kind of suck to say I, need, I needed the funds to hit you. But anyways, um, the truth is that, you know, I could have dropped a TP with mole funds if I didn't move to trigger price of failure twice. But again, doing that is worse for me. So this way, I have a reasonable explanation for why I didn't give the funds back so they don't get spiteful. And I also don't have to spend the funds, and I set the moles further behind. So that's the end of this turn. Now, very quickly before we move on to turn six, we want to go to bird turn five because they have to make a very interesting... They start up some very interesting table talk. So the birds kind of see the game speeding away. And they know they can race to some extent, but they could race more given all these juicy trade posts around. So the birds are starting to question whether or not they should actually hit the Harrier as they don't believe that a single damage will do enough damage to forest them and feel like they need to race. Um, I convinced them, like I'm very strong in my opinion that a good hit of like three is enough to hamper the Harrier enough that they may have to forest or take a limping turn. And I truly believed that, but I needed to convince them that that was the case. Regardless of what the Vagabond thought, because they may not have cho chosen to... Um, they may not have chosen to uh, forest, but I really wanted him to hit the Harrier because the Harrier right now is my biggest threat to racing, to racing me. Um... So in their interests, I offer, I was like, hey, you know, I know you're considering that. Why don't you smack like this trade post in five and then hit the Harrier once instead of hitting them twice? Because they had two cards they could put into their uh, battle decree. They could put in a fox. And I think they already had, they had one bird, I believe. Uh, or no, I don't even think they had any battles at this point. 
Um, they just kind of been putting running around, putting trade posts down, but they could put two cards into battle and then go ham on the moles. Um, or not go ham on the moles, go ham on the Harrier. So I was like, hey, you know, you just got coffins. Uh, you're going to get a point from that. You're going to get two roosts down. Um, you're going to get a trade post for two points since they're despot. Like, you were looking at a seven-point turn. So I'm like, and you're putting the Harrier behind. So that, like, that catches you right up. That puts the Harrier behind. And that's very true. Um, and I did manage to convince them to go hit the Harrier, which I was very happy with. Now, unfortunately for the birds, they actually miscalculated their their moves and then hit my trade so they moved like from one into nine then to four and into eight and then hit my trade post but then realized they actually didn't leave enough birds to double build i think they only left birds in either nine or four i think they left one bird in nine but didn't leave any in four and then they had three birds left in eight to battle the harrier but then realized oh my gosh i can't double build um so they were actually forced to battle the moles um and because of that, you realize, wait, they they need a good roll here or they turmoil. And not only that, the moles ambush them with a fox ambush they've been showing for ages. And the birds do, in fact, turmoil, which sucked for them. However, this was great for me. Like either outcome, birds hitting the harrier or the birds turmoiling are both good for me. I would have kind of preferred they hit the harrier. But unfortunately for them, they do turmoil and for me it knocks another it knocks a faction out of the race which i am a fan of overall but again i would have preferred the harrier to have been hit so that is the total end of what happens on turn five all right so here we are the top of round six i ended up keeping my prices at two at the end of the last round um because the birds had actually I forgot to mention this, but the birds had made a promise um, that they would buy a bird card at two at the start of their turn. It was kind of a promise, kind of not. It was more of like a, hey, like I can use it to hit the Vagabond because I need a bird card. Um, but they end up actually going back on that. And I was I was really worried at the time because coming into this turn, uh, it was actually possible now, because my prices were at two, for the Vagabond to just buy the sword out from under me and just give me two free otter payments since, um, of course, it would require, uh, you know, exhausting two of their items. They're not in the forest, so they maybe don't want to, but there was the possibility that they could do that, and I was really worried. They didn't, thankfully. Um, and the moles ended up buying soup kitchens and was an interesting choice. I don't remember exactly why they did that, but yeah. That's what happened there. Um, why, that's why the prices were at two. And I forgot to touch on that at the end of last turn. But uh, anyways, so that's the board state. Or that's my board state. Now to the board state. So Vagabond turn six. Uh, Vagabond's able to continue popping off in points. They actually moved into uh, clearing 12. They cleaned up a bunch of cardboard, move in 10, hit my trade post. Uh, so they were able to put themselves up to 22 points they were also able to craft the crossbow with the mouse crossbow card to prevent me from being able to craft it and giving them an extra item that they can use, of course. Uh, now, at this point, I'm kind of scared. It's possible that they win next turn if they have some decent crafts in their hand. So I'm keeping a close eye on them and am probably going to hit them a lot. Now, the moles kind of see the writing on the wall, and they realize they're unable to keep up in the points race and pivot to a dom. Unfortunately, they were not set up well for the bird dom that they played and weren't actually able to threaten it this turn. And now I'm remembering why they bought soup kitchens to exchange it for a bird dom. Um, this is good for me because it means I don't have to worry about the moles. They can't do the bird dom yet. I wouldn't say this was like a dumb decision by them or anything because it was like they knew they weren't going to be able to keep up in the points race after losing that many buildings. So it was like, you know, go for the Hail Mary, right? Um, at turn six, at this point, the game is looking really good for me, barring how strong the Vagabond is. And they are the only faction that could win next turn. Again, you know, looking at the Eerie Turmoil as well. Uh, they're not a threat at the moment. Now, I am on a two-turn clock if I can secure at least a single non-trade post point. But the more of those points I score, the better. 
I have enough otters and enough trade posts down that I don't care about what I draw at the start of the turn. And with most of the craftables having been crafted, the only thing that will be really useful is an ambush. That said, there are five otters between 7 and 11 um, that I am going to bring to hit the Vagabond since I really do need to. So I don't care too much about getting ambushed since I'll have three remaining to deal hits. And he may not have another ambush. I don't know. It's hard to say. We know that one bird's gone, the bunny's gone, the fox is gone, but we don't know about the actual, the other bird and the mouse. Um, you could argue that I could draw first there, but to be honest, I don't think it really ended up mattering. So the first thing I do on my turn is I Propaganda Bureau in clearing nine. This is important for me because I'm just chasing some final cardboard points while I need to hit the Vagabond. I think the Vagabond doesn't give me any points. So I'm like, hey, I need some points. How can I do that? Propaganda Bureau this one bird in nine with the useless, uh, I think, yeah, the useless bag uh, because the Vagabond had also crafted the bag out at one point. Um, so Propaganda Bureau with that useless bag card in nine, hit the roost. Um, so that is the first thing I do on my turn. Um, they thankfully don't have an ambush, so I do get it. Uh, I was a little bit worried about the possible ambush risk, but they didn't have it. So next, I move up the river with my collection of otters uh, from 7 and 11 and hit the Vagabond. He does, he does in fact, have the mouse ambush, uh, so I lose two otters. Um, but I end up rolling... Let's see. Let's see. Maybe not that. Yeah, let me <laughs> check here. Yeah, okay. Very good roll. So here's the start of the rolls you after the back. ambush has been played. Eventually. Good roll. Ooh. Very good roll. So I open up with a 3 0. Fantastic. I'm very, very happy with that roll. You know, the rolls were not working out very well against the moles, but now looking a little bit better big for elevaris's game yep big for my big, game big, big for tree fences game too just in the wrong direction love to roll anything other than a zero for me one oh so rolled a one zero not the most fantastic turn or not the most fantastic roll but three zero was amazing and i was very happy with that are very good. <laughs> and then i roll again and roll a two zero so at that point i'm like okay looking pretty good at this point he pretty much has to forests he uh he only has two crossbows a sword and a bag undamaged and there's no way he's going to win with that now one thing i am cognizant of however is that the vagabond could have drawn a t in the deck reshuffle which just happened um the eerie turmoil uh, the deck just got reshuffled and there were three t's in the discard he could have drawn one on his last turn um so, and if he did, he would most certainly win when he comes out of the forests. So, after all of this, uh, and he damages all his stuff, I have six funds left. I have one sword in my hand, uh, but I'm confident no one buys it on my next turn if I price it four. Endgame otters, you generally want to price it four. You don't, you don't want your crafting to be pulled out from under you, and you don't want other people to be able to win off the cards that they buy from you. Um... So I'm going to price it for really kind of prevent other people from buying without guaranteeing me the win. Um, so especially because I can't win, there's no point like just dropping three trade posts with these funds. So I'm just kind of like, hey, why don't I draw? The deck just got reshuffled. I could do I could maybe pull up one of the three T's if there's still three. Maybe there's two. Uh, that are in the deck and that doesn't feel too bad like that's the odds aren't terrible and there's a few other crafts but i was really looking at the t's um because there's still one that hasn't been crafted maybe i could pull up a t instantly craft it two more points and at that point i'm pretty much guaranteed um so that's what i'm keeping an eye out for and however there is also an anvil and two more swords in the discard that i could pull up as well though i wasn't thinking too much about that uh, at the time it was really the t's i was looking at uh, you could ask, you know, why did I not trade post with, uh, why not, why don't I just like trade post and craft the sword? If I only have the one craftable and there's two left, 
I'm not concerned about it getting crafted out from under me, under me and I know no one's going to buy it. And I want to conserve my funds and use them as much as I can before I burst. I was like, hey, I'm just going to craft on my last turn because that's a safe craft. Two swords are not getting crafted next turn. Like, I can guarantee two swords are not getting crafted because there aren't enough crafting pieces from the people that are on the board. And the deck just reshuffled, so not many people have drawn from it yet. Um, so, I decide to start drawing. See what, what craftables we can get on our final turn. So, I drew once, and I get Corvid Planners, and I drew a second time... Uh, and I get a crafted out boot. Actually, it was in the other order. Um, and then I draw a third time. And unfortunately, at this point, I get another sword. If I had got the sword on the draw before this, at that point, I would have dropped a trade post with two moles and crafted the sword because it's impossible for me to craft two swords on the same turn. So it's at that point, it's inefficient to have two swords in my hand. And I would much rather craft one this turn and then craft the next sword the next turn. Um, so if I had four funds left at this point, I, I totally would have done that. But unfortunately, I don't. So I can't place a second Fox DP and thus can't craft the sword. So um, one of the things I also kind of want to point out a little bit is you'll notice as I was going through this turn, I pretty much kept two of every type of fund as long as I could in case I needed to TP. So that's something you, you also want to be aware of, like what exactly, like which funds you are committing, because that is very important. Um, so at this point, you know, I got the sword. I'm hoping for a T and I get an anvil. I, f I forget the anvil is actually in the discard because it was in the Erie decree. They locked it in their decree. Uh, and I was like, oh my gosh, anvil, this is amazing because I can craft it. And this is two more points. Um, so huzzah, this is amazing. I can commit the fund for two points, and at this point, I have hit the 12 non-trade post funds I need to win the game if I can drop all my remaining trade posts. And I'm happy to craft it. I'm not worried about the hair you're getting it because, again, there's no way they're winning on their next turn. They just don't have the action economy um, with the amount of damaged items they have. Um, and with one fund left, I end up, let's see, I, yeah, I draw the hammer, I craft it, one fund left to draw informants, oh my gosh, useless. But given the events of the turn, I have the win guaranteed next turn. So we are looking pretty happy right now. Um, Vagabond, again, could draw a T now that the deck has been reshuffled, so we're thinking about that. But now that the Vagabond is forested, we should be okay. So that is the end of turn six. All right, so here we are at the top of round seven, what should be the final turn of the game and the first daughter's win of the tournament. The Vagabond did have to forest, the moles set up their bird dom, and the birds were unable to do much because of their recently turmoiled decree. But before I get into this, I just want to note real quick where this bake sale came from. I didn't show it in the footage, but I did use Charm Offensive last turn. Why did I do that? Because someone went for Dom. And despite Dom taking your points tracker off the board, you can still quote unquote gain points when you go for Dom, but they just don't matter. So you can actually, if you've Charm Offensive crafted, can continually Charm Offensive the person who went for Dom turn after turn, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect anything. So that is a big upside to crafting Charm Offensive in a game where someone goes for Dom. And that's where I got Bake Sale from. Which, well, it doesn't really matter because I have, uh, or both the coins are crafted out. It is my favorite card in the game because I just think the art is so cute. The little bunnies come in here. The one older bunny paying for the smaller bunny to just nom some cupcakes is, is just adorable. And funnily enough, this carrot cake actually looks identical to the one that I made for my wife before I realized what this cake actually looked like on the card which was really funny so i'm very happy to have it in my hand going into the final turn just a nice little you know additional morale boost besides what's already happening so we have 14 funds we're honestly looking really good and i'm just gonna play the video out all right we are gonna start by well don't forget some of them are from harrier purchasing true missing two moles it should be an easy win here you go you get your moles back <laughs> oh thank you Easy enough that I'm not sitting here mathing it out because it feels like it should be pretty doable in multiple ways. All the trade posts right now. Maybe. 
Uh, trade post and crafting, I think. I think I might have it. Oh my I think god. I do have it. It does. Oh yeah. I'm gonna trade post again with mold. What's the other box? Or we could. I think I would have preferred to do the mouse. More. I guess it doesn't I'm really going matter. To, uh, use two otter funds to trade post. In mouse. Okay. Ooh, that propaganda bureau in nine really helps helps with the trade posting with your own funds. Yeah. 26. I like that. And then I'm going to use... Yeah. Uh, oh, goodbye, bird. To trade post in one. The trade post that we have left. I'm going to craft the sword. For two points. We should be at eight points. We missed somewhere. We got too oh, excited. I didn't get my points for my fourth trade post. And then there. I'm gonna grab the sword for two points. Yeah, there it is. And, and I think we still had, I think we still had okay. funds to drop it in ten as well. Like this was a super. Yeah. Oh. Of, I'm we got our otters win. Otter win. Otter win. So there we are. The first otters win of the annual Root Winter Tournament of 2023. Everything came together. Despite the extremely racy game and the runaway Vagabond and the moles with what looked like an impregnable clearing, we managed to pull off the first Otters win of the tournament, which I was super excited about. So happy to be able to do that. And yeah, so there we go. That is turn seven. All right. So before I bid you all farewell and thank you guys for accompanying me on this journey where you hopefully learned a bunch I would like to solidify some of those learnings through a summary of the main points that I want you to take away from this video. Now, through all of the points I'm about to share with you, keep this in mind. The 12 non-trade post points that you need to win are your guiding lights. These are in large part what should drive your decision making and tell you what you need to do outside of policing. If you do not get these 12 non-trade post points, you do not win. As such, when I talk about deciding what you need to do on your turn, figuring out if a buy benefits you or if it makes sense to meet the terms of a proposed deal, keep the 12 non-trade post points at the front of your mind. That said, remember that policing is sometimes necessary and may not net you points. So first of all, table talk is extremely important to play otters in the current meta. Not only do you need to make deals and keep table credibility for a good portion of the game, but you need to know when to break them or when the deals may be bad for you. When you do break deals, you need to do so in a way that won't cause spite from the other members of the table. Try to come up with reasonable excuses, such as not being able to give back funds due to needing an own unknown number of battles and wanting to be extra safe. When thinking about making deals, consider who the threat is and if you can get someone to buy from you to incentivize policing that threat. On my first turn, it was, hey VB, if you buy from me, it'll set me up well to hit the moles. And of course, if you want people to be buying from you, make sure you remind them when they can buy. Some people just forget. Secondly, it's also important to hold on to your funds as long as you can. Although you didn't hear a lot of the audio from my descriptions of the game, you'll hopefully realize that I was very stringent with when I gave back funds. I really only gave the birds back their funds and only when they said they were going to buy again and I believed that buy would benefit me. While it can feel tempting to drop trade posts every single turn to let people keep buying from you, the low amount of funds per turn that that leaves you with is likely not enough to close the 12 points you need that aren't TPs. Additionally, if you are a threat to win, people would stop buying from you and halt you in your tracks. Your voracious spending can result in not enough funds left to close the distance if that does indeed happen. Now third, you want to make sure you're calculating what you need to do on your turn and how many funds that will take and then use leftover funds to draw at the start of your turn. 
This is a good rule of thumb, but bear in mind that to do this successfully, you want to keep tabs on what good cards could still be in the deck. Have we seen all the coins? Tees, swords, the hammer, how about prop bureau, coffins, false orders, saboteurs? When a bunch of these cards could still remain in the deck, drawing should be a top priority and we want to make sure we do it first thing on our turn if drawing any of these cards would affect the turn. It should be noted that drawing first usually matters more in the early game when you have very few trade posts out and it could affect where you decide to place them. In my case, past the mid game, I had two bunnies, one fox and one mouse, so it didn't really matter what I pulled and when other than the sword towards the end of the game. But that said, it would still in general be advised to draw first for the chance you pick up something like an ambush if you need to do some policing. So why didn't I? Well, the times I didn't draw first were due to having some very crucial battles in which I could have gotten really screwed by RNG. So because whatever I drew would not have changed my turn drastically, and because I wanted the extra safety of tons of battles, I decided to draw with leftover funds. Fourth, you need to judge the factions at the table and figure out how you should approach the game. Can I sit back and go for dividends? Do I need to police anyone shortly? into the game. This game was full of racing factions, so I did not have the time to sit back and I recognized that really early on, prompting me to police early and aggressively. Make sure you're paying attention to the board state and who the threat is. If I had not forested the Harrier twice that game myself, they would have ran away with it. Finally, uh, and this is a minor point, but can be super beneficial at times. Really think about when a sale actually benefits you. Keep the 12 points in mind. Is selling coins and tea for four funds total really worthwhile when I could just sell the tea for three and then keep the coins and craft it? Do I really want the birds to buy it too? Does having more of their funds get me anything right now? And if it does, is it worth the concessions I have to make to secure the purchase? And that's it. So let me know what you think in the comments below. The Otters have been my favorite faction since I started playing Root, and it was honestly pretty amazing to be able to bring them their first win in the winter tournament with a ton of people and my amazing wife supporting me. It took everything I knew about the faction to bring it home, and now in the wake of that, I hope that this video has helped you and has provided some insight into piloting the faction at a more advanced level. And now, I'd like to thank you all for watching. Have a great rest of your day. Cheers, guys.